Our next guest, I'm very thrilled and delighted to welcome Rainbow Rowell. Yes, let's hear it for Rainbow Rowell. Rainbow, as you know, is a New York Times best-selling author. She writes books about misfits and nerds, or people who feel like misfits and nerds, and how they find their way through life, cracking each other up and falling in love. She is the author of Attachments, Eleanor and Park, Fangirl, and Landline. Rainbow's books are all international bestsellers and award winners. Eleanor and Park received the prestigious Michael L. Prince Honor for Excellence in Young Adult Literature. This fall, Rainbow continues to break boundaries with Carry On, an epic fantasy following the triumphs and heartaches of Simon and Baz from her beloved bestseller, Fangirl. Please welcome Rainbow Rowell. He said it, and, and I believed it when he said it. Um, I was promised that I wouldn't have to follow an Irish person. Um, so that's the first broken promise of today. Uh, yeah, I'm incredibly nervous. It's always funny to me, uh, since I began writing books, I get invited to speak, give speeches and talk. Which is bizarre because, like, the whole gig is you finally get to write books and you never have to talk to people anymore. <laughs> like, you just sit and eat cheese in a cave. Um, and only <laughs> So I feel like maybe um, my mother asked you to invite me just to get me out of the house. It's very therapeutic for me. Um, thank you for having me. And especially before I get started. Uh, thank you. I guess I've already started. Thank you for supporting my books. Um, it was your support for Eleanor and Park. The independent booksellers were some of the first people who read and liked Eleanor and Park. Um, thank you. It was that person, actually. And when you, um, my first book, Attachments, is a, it's a lovely book, and you should read it. I think you'd all like it. Um, <laughs> but not many people did when it came out. And so when Eleanor and Park came out, I had this feeling of, like, no one, no one is going to read this book. And when booksellers and librarians actually started getting back, started talking about it before it came out, that enthusiasm really got, kind of reverberated in my, with my publisher and, and on my team. And we all, we all got like more excited and felt more optimistic. And I felt like it, your early enthusiasm really just made a huge difference for me. So thank you. Um, and also your enthusiasm for Fangirl means that I get a special edition of Fangirl with a ribbon bookmark, which I'm really happy about, um, and some fan art. It's very fancy. I even like, I have, I have fangirl like theme nails today. I'm so excited about it. Um, so I get asked probably most if I always thought I was going to become a writer. Or, you know, like, did you always think you're going to write books? And, and the answer to that is no, because I wasn't delusional. Um, even as a child, I knew that, like, not many people get to do that. In fact, I thought no one got to do that. I never looked at books on the shelf and thought, that came from a human being. And maybe this is because we were very religious and I thought all books came from God. <laughs> Magic and luck. And I also thought you had to be dead, like postage stamps, you know, like you don't get a book until you're dead. Um, so I didn't know, I did not plan on being a writer. I really wanted to be a librarian. Um, yeah. yeah. Not because I wanted to share books, I don't think. I think I just wanted to tell people what to read. Like, I wanted to be the person who, like, looks up very judgily. Um, and I also really wanted a stamp, which would have been a ripoff because I don't even think librarians get stamps anymore. Like, I just imagined my whole day would be opening books and stamping, opening books and stamping. And I thought that sounded great. Um, I didn't have a stamp. So uh, my, my life took a turn in high school because I, I changed schools. I um, actually started a school that was built kind of in a circle. And I, oops, sorry. I changed schools because I kept getting lost. <laughs> yeah, it's truth. Um, so I changed schools and I couldn't get into the classes I wanted, so creative writing was full. I, didn't, I just kind of realized there are people there, so I'm going to look that way for a little while. Hi, hello. There's more of you than I can conceptualize, so <laughs> forgive me. Um, so, so yeah, so I couldn't get into creative writing and I thought I could only get into journalism. And I became very, I got really into journalism as a high schooler. And uh, then I ended up studying journalism. And when I graduated in 1995, there were no jobs, which I guess is kind of like now. 
Um, yeah, maybe, I don't know. So I graduated in 1995 and I thought, I'm gonna be a journalist because journalists have health insurance. And it's a way that you can write and have health insurance. You can be an artist, sort of, uh, and still pay the bills and have a car. So I went into journalism and my first job was as this Western Iowa reporter for the Omaha World Herald in Omaha, Nebraska. Yeah, woo, me and that person. So that's, I hope that's the same person who liked Eleanor and Park. Um, <laughs> This person's like my soulmate. Um, so, as you, I mean, Western Iowa reporter for the Omaha World Herald is like the least important job at the Omaha World Herald. Um, my job was literally to read stacks of small town newspapers. Have you ever, are you from a small town? It's like, we all know Jim and Helga, yeah? Their, their daughter came back from college for dinner. She came to church. So my job was to go through and read these small town newspapers and find stories. Um, it was slim pickings, and my <laughs> fingers were stained gray all day, every day. Uh, so so I, I kind of made my name at the World Herald by covering uh, bizarre things that happened in Western Iowa. Fortunately, there were many. Um, like, I covered, you probably heard of these stories because it is how I made my name. That's how I became my, my road to fame. About the uh, Western Iowa pork queen. Do you know about pork queens? <laughs> Yeah, like you have beauty queens maybe where you come from. Like we have pork queens and beef queens. So the, the Western Iowa pork queen who was a vegetarian. <laughs> and she's so sweet. She just didn't see a problem with it at all. She was like, I feel really good about pork. I just, I just don't eat it. <laughs> Probably my, my best and most famous story was about um, the largest popcorn ball in the world, which was in Sac County, Iowa. I told this story to John Green and he interrupted me a lot, so I hope you won't, but he was like, no, that's not in Iowa, that's in Illinois, and I was like, listen, mister, <laughs> I actually, I, I was there, it was the largest popcorn ball in the world, and it, it, I've, later, I've later found out there was more than one, but um, it was in Sac County, so the news wasn't that there was a giant popcorn ball in Sac County, that was, that was the news like two years ago, but like when you build the, the biggest popcorn ball in the world, imagine yourself doing it. Okay, now you've had your day in the sun. What do you do with it, right? You can't just throw it away. Um, you put it in a shed. You put the giant popcorn ball, it, the, the biggest popcorn ball in the world in a shed. And then um, two years later, you have a meeting about it and you're like, well, it's getting moldy, you know? <laughs> Plus I need that shed. So, I mean, I, I guess we could blow it up. <laughs> we could probably blow it up. So, at the Sac County Fair that year, the headliner was, see the world's largest popcorn ball get spectacularly blown up. I drove from Omaha for that. I sat through the goat show and I didn't even get to eat like Fritos. Do you know the Frito bags they put chili? Because I was about to get married and I was on a diet, which is, I would eat them now. But okay, so they came out and it was the very end of the, the, the fair and they said, all right guys, we don't know what's going to happen. We're all in the stands. We don't know what's going to happen. We've got dynamite, actual dynamite. We drill the hole in its core. We put the dynamite in there. We don't know what's going to happen. We blow it up. Maybe don't look directly at the popcorn ball. <laughs> well, who's going to listen to that? That's like saying don't look at the sun during an eclipse. We came for the popcorn ball. It's like if you have to look, maybe shield your eyes. I'm just like this. So, the excitement was great, and um, we all counted off together, you know, three, two, one, and then there was a lag, and then it went, <laughs> <laughs> like in just two pieces. It was such a humiliation for Sac County, um, which I made sure the people of Omaha knew about. We kind of resent Western Iowa anyway. Um, so, that, <laughs> that is how I became a columnist. Uh, right? I became a columnist, but writing about nothing. Uh, <laughs> but like, lengthily. <laughs> so, um, I guess there are people here too, I'll talk to you for a while. Uh, so I, I was a columnist, and, and I, I was a columnist very young, and I'd started at the newspaper as an intern, and I don't know if you've ever been an intern somewhere, you, you never stop being the intern. So, like 10 years later, I was in my 30s, and I really like, was kind of like, 
could you get, could you get us coffee? You know, to be like, I'm a columnist, my photo's in the newspaper. I felt like I couldn't grow up at that job. Like I'd always be the kid. Also, um, 10 years is a long time to do any job, right? And uh, I, I, had, I had kind of an important job in that my face was in the paper. And so I was very scrutinized. And it was a very conservative newspaper. And I'm not very, it is a very conservative newspaper. I'm not very conservative. <laughs> um, and so I always wanted to write kind of like funny things. And the problem with writing funny is like not everybody thinks you're funny. <laughs> Uh, some people don't think anything is funny, and some people go into journalism and become editors. <laughs> so if I wanted to get a joke into my column, I had six editors. Six. I'm not exaggerating right at this moment. Um, but, and I, I would have, every single one of them would have to kind of sign off on any of my jokes. So there's no joke. There's just no joke that makes six people laugh, especially those six people. And so I was feeling so frustrated that I started writing the book Attachments, which again is a lovely book that I think you would like. <laughs> I mean, it's good. It's in paperback. It's very affordable. Um, so Attachments, you probably don't know, is a book that's um, it's half email, maybe three-fourths email. It's about a guy who gets a job at a newspaper, much like the Omaha World Herald, um, <laughs> where they read all your email to make sure you're not doing anything bad. I don't know what they thought we were going to do, really, because like we don't have secrets at the newspaper. Everything we know, we give away, like, every day. There's no, like, corporate espionage. We tell everyone everything. Um, but they were very paranoid. It was the early days of the internet and of email, and so they read all of our emails. So I wrote a book about these two... Ooh, so there shouldn't be two of them. I only need one. Um, <laughs> I feel the same way about my hands. Um, so so it's, it's about these two women, and they email it back and forth, and this guy reads the book, or reads their email, and he falls in love with one of them. I made Nathan lay and laugh. None of you matter. <laughs> You're dead to me, independent booksellers. I mean, he's probably just thinking of something he said earlier. Reminiscing about The Lion King, maybe, I don't know, or many of his greatest hits. Okay, so uh, <laughs> attachments. So it's, I, I wrote that book. It's, so it's, this guy falls, I just spoiled it, but it doesn't really matter. I spoil it like on the third page. Um, so he's reading their email and he falls in love with one of the ladies. The ladies. And, um, you know, what are you going to do if you fall in love with someone by reading their email? You can't tell them that. It's super creepy. Um, so it's, it's about him dealing with that dilemma. Uh, I wrote that book because I... I can't write, at that moment, I could not write exposition. Like, you know the part of the book where you're like, and he walked into the room, and it had four walls, and one of the walls was gray, and there was some poster. That's how I wrote. Like, I, I would start describing, I had kind of a, like, I had terrible, like the person who wrote Lord of the Rings, who's very famous, you know his name. <laughs> you know how it's like, and he walked down the road, and then there was a tree, and then there was a guy, and he was singing a song about his pony. Like, that's how I wrote, but bad. Like, I didn't know where to stop. I, would, I just couldn't write Exposition, I could only write dialogue. Um, so I wrote an email book. Uh, and I actually didn't write any of the parts about the guy reading the email. I just wrote the email. And I, I kind of felt like I got that in my system and I would just have kids instead of, like, my, my new thing was I'm just going to have kids. So I put the book away. I had two boys. Um, and my, then, then I got postpartum depression, which I think, I didn't even know. It should, it should just be called postpartum. Because, like, I, I don't know how you're not, like, everybody, you, you know. I just wasn't taking showers, basically. <laughs> <laughs> and no one in the house cared, so I don't think it was that big of a deal. Um, but I knew I was in trouble because my sister, who doesn't even like me that much, started coming over. She loves me, but she started coming over every day to, like, just hang out with me. And um, so she asked if she could read my book, and it was actually my sister reading my book. That's the reason that I finished it, um, just because it made her laugh, and I thought... Uh, she actually she took what I had. It was a printout, and she wrote in blue pen, Ha! funny. Ha! I was like, oh, more of that. I want more. So I, I finished my book. Um, and that I thought was probably it because I'd had that book idea for like seven years and I thought, that's it. That's my one book. That's, that's all I'm going to do. I don't have anything left in me. Um, and I kind of wrote Eleanor in Park thinking, this is my, this is my last shot. Like I, I just, I have to do this. I'm just going to, I'm going to, like, do, I'm going to write everything I've always wanna, wanted to write. I'm going to put it in this book. I've always wanted to write a first love story. I've kind of always wanted to write a book that took place in my teen years in the 80s. 
Um, I want to write about music. And no one's going to read it, so I should make it kind of exactly what I want, which is why you get lots of um, telephone conversations and like that go on for pages and and that bus scene where they're just like usting and angsting for each other. That's what I wanted to read. I mean, I'd been reading Twilight at the time. <laughs> That's another great book. Perhaps you've read it. Um, <laughs> and uh, I loved in those books the way Stephanie Meyer wrote about love, sort of from the perspective of a teenager. Like, there's no moderation in the way Bella feels about Edward. So you can tell everyone that Eleanor and Park was inspired by Twilight. I have no problem with that. <laughs> uh, and I thought, I want, I want to write a book that um, makes people feel like they're falling in love. So that's why I wrote Eleanor and Park. And the thing, I have about three minutes left. And I th I, when I gave the speech at home, it took four minutes. So I made it longer. But I feel like I've covered the best parts of my career. <laughs> um, <laughs> but Eleanor and Park became a YA book, thanks to my, edi my editor, Sarah Goodman, at St. Martin's Press. And um, I found that I was an accidental YA author. Like I didn't really, pl I wrote it for adults. It was actually published for adults in the UK. So when Eleanor and Park became a YA book, that changed my life and, and gave me access to all of these different readers um, who are really great readers who love books. I don't know if you've noticed this, but YA readers don't just love reading, they love books, like the actual book and the experience of holding it and touching it. Um, and so that, that had kind of opened up my whole life, really, and, and put me in a position where I'm kind of constantly talking and being with and communicating with the most passionate readers there are, um, teens and people who like teen books. <laughs> Um, it also means they talk to me a lot on Twitter, like not always nicely. Like if you, if you ever check my mentions, you'll get like people in the Philippines like cussing at me at four o'clock in the morning. I mean, then I'm like, sorry. And they'll be like, oh, Ms. Rell. <laughs> like they're just mad about the ending. It's not like they actually hate me. But um, so I, my plan now is to continue to kind of write the way that I did Eleanor and Park. There was something about writing the, that book not really thinking that anyone was going to read it that gave me a lot of freedom and kind of helped cancel out all of those editorial voices in my head, the bad editorial voices. Um, so I hope that you will continue to read my books. I hope that you'll read Carry On. It's a fantasy. I've never written a fantasy before, so that's good. You probably like it. <laughs> As a former journalist, I wasn't sure about writing a fantasy. Like there was at one point I had to write a dragon scene and I spent hours on the internet reading about dragons. Like I really wanted some specific information about how their wings work. And then like I had this, this moment of, dragons are fake. <laughs> I can just make this up. I, I made it all up. You know? So I hope you enjoy that book. And I really hope you have a great time at BA. I'm already having a good time, thanks to you. So have a great day. Thank you. Rainbow Row. Funding for BookView Now is provided by the Wincote Foundation.